Hi, I'm Alan. Um, I'm an instructor and uh, content creator art and training and also a keen sailor myself. One of my greatest pleasures in life is anchoring and finding those beautiful remote anchorages that nobody else knows about. I've learned many things over the, uh, over the years. I've made some mistakes. I've got things right. So it's always a learning process. Um, but I wanted to share some of my little tricks and techniques and ideas with you uh, today in my little webinar. So hopefully uh, you'll take something away with this, something for the future, something to think about when you're finding your own little beautiful anchorages for your overnight stay. I bought my boat maybe 17 or 18 years ago. And in, in my mind, owning a boat is rather like having a small child or a dog. And I've never had a small child or a dog. But having a boat, you feel sort of an ownership and a responsibility. And that first year I went away, I uh, set off on my travels and uh, pretty for the first month I would anchor the boat and I wouldn't get off the boat. I just thought, oh, what happens if the wind changes or the tide changes? And I stayed on board. And maybe after another month of that, I would get off my boat and I would go ashore and I'd stand on the beach and look at my boat. Uh, and maybe then a month after that, I would be really brave and I'd get off my boat and I'd go to the beach and I'd go for a walk as long as I could see the top of the mast. So you can sort of see where I'm going with this. By the end of that first season, I would happily anchor my boat and I'd go ashore and I'd go for a walk up in the mountains for hours and then I'd even go and leave the boat anchor overnight. So what I'm saying is it's about the confidence, really. It's the confidence in your own ability and it's the confidence in your, your anchoring equipment. Um, and that's what we're hopefully I'm going to be covering tonight. Uh, just before we kind of get into the nitty gritty of anchoring, I just wanted to talk to you about uh, the other options we might have. Uh, and here's the obvious first one, um, marinas. Um, I've got my pros and cons here. And I think uh, for most people who have been out in the water, then the, the marinas offer many great facilities. You've got the security, you've got unlimited water and power. You've got showers, you've got toilets, you've got uh, shops, bars. Fantastic. So really excellent uh, facilities available to you. Of course, there has to be a sort of a downside. Um, and the main one, I think, is it costs money. Now, there are many people, uh, maybe some of you out there, you will budget your holiday, you're away for two or three weeks, and you budget in marinas, and that's absolutely fine. Um but if you are away for a, a long time, it can become costly. And, and just to give you a clue, this year I was up in Scotland on my boat uh, for maybe three months and came back down, brought her back to Cornwall. Probably the cheapest marina uh, for my boat, £28, most expensive £50. This is for a 37-foot, 11-metre uh, sailing boat. Um, and that's fine for a special treat, but obviously if you're paying that night after night after night, it soon becomes uh, quite expensive. Some marinas might disagree with it. I've put not generally attractive. Well, you do get them in nice places, but marinas are just full of lots of boats. Uh, a lot of noise, very busy places. Noisy, especially if it's a bit windy, you've got squeaking fenders and clanking halyards, so you don't often get a great night's sleep in a marina. One pro I haven't got up here is the social aspect. And I will say that marinas are fantastically sociable. If you go into marina, as you're coming in, somebody's bound to take your lines. And uh, as soon as they've done that, you start chatting about where you've come from, where you're going to. Then you're being invited on for a cup of tea or a beer. So they're very sociable, whereas uh, being out at anchor is sometimes a bit of a lonely existence. The other option, of course, is for uh, visitors moorings. Um, I put here easy to pick up. Uh, my boat is a long keeler and she is a bit of a cow in marinas. Uh, and that's why for me, picking up a visitor's mooring is much simpler than trying to drive my boat in and out of marina. And clearly they are going to be cheaper uh, than a marina. But of course the cons are, it still costs you money. It'll be maybe half that a marina costs. And your facilities, the facilities that are available to you, but you'll need to actually use a tender to uh, to get ashore. Or maybe there's a water taxi provided. Um, I've used moorings on many occasions. Uh, they will be secure. 
um, I perhaps just add in here, don't be uh, tempted to pick up any mooring you see. Of course, you have no idea what size boat was designed for that mooring, and you've got no idea if it's been serviced or not. Whereas if you go into a harbour that's got proper visitors' moorings, you know that they will have been serviced, and they'll be rated to a certain tonnage. And if it's not marked on the buoy, then the harbour master will tell you if your boat is suitable for that mooring. But we come back to the question again then, why anchor? Because you get to go to these most amazing places, fantastic, away from the hustle and bustle. Uh, you see some amazing things. And, of course, it doesn't cost you any. So I pose this question next. Where uh, where can we anchor? Here we go. Here's a little uh, a chartlet. Admiral chart. You can see clearly in the middle there is a nice little anchor there. That's a clear symbol for us that this is a place that we could anchor. Here's another one. This is from the uh, Savvy Navi app. Some of you may well have this on your, your tablets or your phones. Uh, this has got a little anchorage here. And you can see there's a bit more information, which is very useful. It tells, it tells us or the wind it's protected from um, and the facilities you might find there. But just do remember that these anchorages that are marked in the charts or in the apps, or indeed you might find uh, possibly in a, a cruising guide like this, uh, they will be popular. So you're pretty much sure if you go to these languages, you'll find a lot of other boats there. So the question, where can we anchor? Well, pretty much anywhere we want to. And that's the beauty of anchoring. If we are uh, on our boat, we can go pretty much anywhere in the world um, and find a lovely little place and we can put our anchor down. There are a few restrictions. Um, clearly, busy commercial harbours. Uh, will not allow anchoring uh, military ports. Um, and also there will be environmental areas, uh, delicate environments, uh, eel grass, coral reefs, where they don't want people anchoring, destroying the environment. But apart from those very small places, uh, we can go any we want to in the world, drop our anchor. No restrictions. Now, of course, if there's not a lovely anchor marked in our chart, well, how do we know if it's any good? And I'd say, well, with a bit of experience, you can start creating your anchor anchorages. Have a look at the chart. Look, at, look to see if it looks like it might be sheltered. And you can do a bit of surveying yourself. There's a little picture here. This is my little handheld depth sounder. So I can go in in my dinghy and I can explore. Uh, and I can measure the depth, see what water's there. Um, and in addition, we have a great, I say new tool, we've had it around for a long time, but Google Earth is actually phenomenal for this sort of thing. And this is a little chartlet. I think it's uh, it's Pabe in the Outer Hebrides up in Scotland. And the chartlet doesn't really give a lot of detail, but you can see the Google Maps pictures tells us what a lovely sandy bay is, perfect for anchoring in. And so... With these little tools, you can find your own little secret hiding places. So anchoring considerations. There's a few here. Um, shelter. I'm not going to talk too much about this. Um, mo well, all of you are some way into your art courses, your day skipper, your yacht master, and your fast track. And we've got a fantastic depth of knowledge in these courses. Lots of information will tell you the basics of anchoring. And this is something you will also cover in your practical courses. So I'm not going to spend time talking about shelter. Um, and depth, I wasn't going to bother, but I was just talking to my other half uh, earlier today about depth. And she regaled a story about how she had anchored her boat in the uh, Isles of Scilly. And she had put insufficient chain out and the tide had come in and the boat dragged and almost ended up in the rocks. And that also reminds me uh, of one of my favorite, uh, favorite sailing books. Uh, many of you may be fans of Arthur Ransom. And my favorite book of Arthur Ransom was We Didn't Mean to Go to Sea, where they anchor on the shelf at Harwich and uh, the tide comes in. They haven't got sufficient uh, chain out and the boat drags and drifts out, causing much uh, adventures for the children aboard. But what I did want to talk to you about was uh, a swell, which I think is something that is is often uh, underestimated. And swell is this sort of insidious thing that we don't really think about it. We know we need to find a harbour that's beautifully sheltered, 
but swell can make life pretty miserable. Um, for for us who sail on the west coast, I'm down in Falmouth, but we've got the Atlantic out the west, and even in calm conditions, this swell rolls in, and the west coast of Brittany, certainly the Isles of Scilly, going up the Welsh coast, going up the Irish coast, even in good conditions, there is some swell. It almost seems insignificant, and yet just a few inches is going to ruin your day. My boat is uh, very classic in design. She's, uh, I think they call it slack bilges. She's very narrow, and she rolls horribly. So I want to tell you this little swell story, and uh, you'll see that this swell story is Tobermory Harbour. And uh, I was anchored here in Tobermory Harbour. Uh, this is last year. And the forecast was coming in for a northwesterly six to seven. So pretty fresh winds. And I looked at my, my little chart here and I thought, well, that's great. Tobermory is perfect. What perfect shelter for these strong winds that are coming in. But little did I know, even though the uh, Scottish waters are protected uh, from the Outer Hebrides, with the Outer Hebrides, that northwesterly wind came in, rolled right across the Minch, right way down north of Coal, came down past the entrance to Tobermory and into the Sound of Mull. And here we had almost the perfect storm because my boat was pointing into that northwesterly wind. And of course, that insidious swell just found its way in round the corner. And we rolled like crazy. And I was woken up rudely at five o'clock in the morning, being thrown out of my bed. I think I managed a cup of tea before I started to go green. I leapt into my dinghy and went ashore for the day. And I just sat, sat there in a local cafe looking at my boat, rolling crazy from side to side. And um, thankfully, by six o'clock in the evening, the swell finally died. And I got back, back on board. Um, do not underestimate, underestimate swell. It can make your life pretty miserable. Uh, this is my secret weapon. This is me anchored in the sillies. You'll see my boom is pushed right out here. And there's something hanging off the end here. And it's what I call my, my flopper stopper. I discovered this years ago. When I bought the boat, she got a drogue with her uh, for bad conditions, which I've never used. But I had this idea that I could hang the drogue off the end of the boom with a big uh, weight on the end of it, a, a diver's weight. Here is Sue modeling the uh, flopper stopper. Uh, normally, somebody doesn't have to sit in it. And it works remarkably well in that if you are rolling backwards and forwards, when the boat rolls down, the, uh, the little drogue drops into the water. And as the boat rolls back, it inflates and slows the boat down. The difference it makes is phenomenal and makes what can be a really miserable anchorage, a very comfortable anchorage. Okay, a little bit about seabed now. And for those who've done the course or halfway through the course, you may have looked at this. Uh, things we like for anchoring, uh, sand and mud. Uh, things we definitely don't like for anchoring, uh, rock and weed. But I thought, well, what else should we consider? And you'll see here I've got gravels, pebbles, and cobbles. Uh, cobbles are basically big, big pebbles. And this certainly is not somewhere you might choose to anchor. But I always say, well, you know, be flexible in your outlook. And if you are just stopping for a lunch break, uh, maybe stopping for a swim, then that's fine. You'll often see if you anchor that your boat is held really by the weight of the chain and the weight of the anchor. Uh, there's no strain on it whatsoever. And even also, if, if weather conditions are really settled, I've anchored overnight uh, in gravel. The boat's not going to go anywhere. So do consider this as an option. But clearly, if you're expecting some bad condition, a bit of wind, then we are going to want back to our old favor, favorite and, and use sand and mud. So anchoring equipment. Again, in our day skipper and the yacht master and the fast track courses, there's a lot of information about anchors. So all the pictures, the latest designs and, and good information about them. And I've just posed this question here. Um, are new anchor designs better than old designs? And again, I've got a little story. Many years ago, when I first bought the boat, I was over in France, in you know, Rad de Brest, uh, and I dropped my anchor. And I was brought up, I was an age, I was brought up at the old CQR plow anchor. That was always the classic anchor that all boats had. 
And on this occasion, it was a, a designated anchorage that said the holding was good. I dropped my anchor and it didn't hold. And they were the days my boat had a mechanical windlass. So I cranked the wind, the anchor back up again and I moved and I dropped the anchor again and it didn't hold. I winched the anchor up again, getting a bit tired. I dropped the anchor on the third time. It dragged yet again, and I was getting extremely frustrated and extremely tired. Um, and also, night was drawing in. And I got on my deck. Uh, my backup anchor was a Bruce anchor, which is kind of like a claw design. And I quickly, out of fury, really, I unshackled the anchors. I put the Bruce anchor on. I put it over the side, and it bit first time. And, of course, from then on, my Bruce was my favorite anchor, and my CQR was designated to sit on the as, on the deck of Sphere and hasn't moved really since. And that uh, Bruce did me pretty well for many years. It did let me down a few times, but anchor designs have improved. There's a lot more science about it and a lot more testing. And about three or four years ago, I bought myself a, a Rockner anchor, and it is just absolutely fantastic. It really has made a difference, and I have much more confidence in its ability. And so very simply, uh, are new anchors better? Yes, they are. Alongside this, I'd just like to uh, talk about size. Size matters. Um, here's a, This is a typical table from an anchor manufacturer. This is for the Rockner. And uh, the recommendation for my boat, 37 feet, 11 meters, about seven tons. It says 15 kg. And I will say to you, always go up a size. Okay. Within reason, don't get something ridiculously big, but if you go up a size, uh, the heavier it is, the better it's going to be. Just remember, you've got to be able to move this anchor around. And, and an example for me, my boat lives in a mooring, and when she's on the mooring, I have to take the anchor off the roll and move inboard. So I'm always moving it backwards and forwards. So don't get an anchor that's so big you can't actually handle it. But I'd say always go for a big size up. I've got a uh, 20 kilo rock there on my boat and i think ed and charlie have actually got it one more they're up to 25s so the bigger the better a chain or warp or both indeed um i would say pretty much most cruising boats chain is definitely the way to go because it is heavy and it is strong but i do appreciate some of you will be dinghy sailors you will perhaps use ribs or small sailing boats where having lots of that heavy chain at the front of the boat is not going to be very good you'll be a bit bow heavy and so for smaller boats having a a rope uh, as opposed to chain is going to be much more sensible for you just remember if you are using rope you should have two or three meters of chain uh, as well because you do need the weight to keep the anchor down and it also avoids chafing of the rope on the seabed. Um, but I uh, I would say if you are a, a sort of bigger, serious cruising boat, you should be looking at uh, at chain. Um, I just perhaps mentioned it as well, obviously, if you're a racing boat, uh, a racing sailing boat, well, you might not even carry an anchor at all. And if you do, it's probably going to be a minimal size with minimal chain. Length, I don't quite know where it comes from, but uh, 60 meters seems to be a pretty standard length for chain. That's all I've got on my boat. Uh, and for those of you who have got that far in the courses you're doing, you probably will remember that uh, when it comes to how much chain you put out, you put out four times the depth. Well, clearly 60 meters means I can anchor in 15 meters, should I wish. And invariably, in fact, I anchor in more like five meters so 60 meters is going to give me plenty in most most conditions. This is a little thing that is in my head. It's not crucial, but I like to talk about it. Um, for most of us, we have galvanized anchors, mast steel galvanized, and our chain is mast steel that is galvanized. And we want to have similar metals. And so when you're shackling your chain to your anchor, you should be using a galvanized shackle. And many people have a little uh, stainless steel uh, shackle there. I think we all like to go to a chancery and like to buy little shiny things and a little shiny stainless steel shackles is perfect. But it is a dissimilar metal and you will get corrosion, especially you've got dissimilar metals in salt water. You will get corrosion. Now, I'm not going to put fear into you. It's not going to dissolve overnight. But if you have got a stainless steel shackle, you should be just checking your chain 
uh, and where it's shackled on the anchor just from time to time. Far better. Save your money. Buy a little galvanized shackle. It's much, much cheaper and it's better for the job. Clearly, if you've got the money and you've got a stainless steel anchor and stainless steel chain, which some boats do, then, of course, you're going to use a stainless steel shackle. Mousing. For those who don't know, mousing is a sort of a security thing we do to shackles. We, When we put our shackles on, we do it up tightly with a shackle key or a pair of pliers. But there's always the risk that these shackles can work undone as, throughout the, as the season goes through. And traditionally, we used to mouse them with mousing wire. And this little picture uh, over here shows that. And that stops it being the pin unscrewing itself from the shackle. And maybe 25 years ago came the invention of the fantastic cable tie. Um, and I was a convert, really. And so all my shackles these days, I shackle up. Um, I put a, a cable tie on there. And that's absolutely fine. But I will say uh, that's fine for everything else. But when it comes to shackling your anchor onto your anchor chain, you want to use mousing wire because there's a lot of abrasion. Your anchor's going down. It's sitting in sand, coarse sand. It's sitting in rocky areas. If you use plastic cable ties, they're going to break through pretty quickly. And there's a chance the pin can come out. And also, of course, we're polluting the sea with yet more plastic. So absolutely, when it comes to your anchor, don't use a plastic cable tie. Use proper mousing wire. And this is the stuff. It's uh, model wire. It is very resistant proof to rot and rust uh, and is flexible. So we can use this for uh, mousing. And I have to say, with all the kind of ongoing pollution in our seas, the plastic particles in the seas, um, we really should go be going back to using mousing wire, which is a much more natural material. But the process just takes a lot longer. But it's it's something to think about. So the windlass, manual uh, or electric. And if you remember my story, when I was uh, when I couldn't get my anchor to bite, and I was winch pulling up my uh, my anchor, uh, and it wasn't biting, and I was winching away manually. Uh, it certainly kept me fit. Um, but that year, I actually managed to break my. Uh, my windlass, I decided it was time for a new one. And I originally thought, well, I'd buy myself another manual uh, windlass. And the more I thought about it, I thought, well, actually, there's a bit of a security device here because I knew what would happen. After three or four times of trying to set the anchor, you eventually just go, oh, it'd be fine. And then you spend all night in your bed worrying about, are you going to drag? And so I thought about this and thought, well, maybe an electric windlass is better because if the anchor doesn't bite, you can pull it up. You just press that button and go, dugga, 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 and the anchor comes up and you move and you put it back down again. Then you can do this two or three or four times, no problem at all. Um, I have to say I'm not as fit as I used to be when I had a manual windlass, but I do find having an electric one, it gives me peace of mind that I will keep anchoring until I know that the anchor is bedded in properly. One thing I would say is if you're going for an electric windlass, uh, I would make sure you've got one that can be used mechanically. This is uh, a Lofrance Tigris. This is what I've got my boat. And you've got the option to put a handle in here and manually winch it up. Because if you do have a problem, electrical failure, uh, flat batteries, you can still get the anchor up. Whereas you can buy electric windlasses that you are just electric. And of course, if that fails, you could be in trouble. Aha, so the snubber, what is it? and Why do we use it? So your anchor windlass is designed for pulling anchors up and lowering anchors. It's not designed for taking the strain. And in strong conditions, your boat may be shearing around, back and forwards. A lot of strain actually on the windlass. And use a chance you can actually damage the shaft in there. And so what we do instead is we use a piece of rope, uh, something stretchy, a piece of nylon rope, and we tie this onto the anchor chain, and then we bring it aboard, and we make it off onto a cleat. And then we can let the chain out a little bit. And the idea is that all the strain is on the rope, and it stretches as the boat moves around, and none of the strain is actually on the anchor chain. In addition, and certainly from my perspective, I sleep at the front of my boat, and without a snubber, I can hear the chain grumbling backwards, forwards in the roll. It can be quite noisy, but when you put the snubber on, it's nice and quiet. 
So you are protecting the anchor windlass and you're actually reducing the sound from the actual chain on the roller. Just quickly, uh, you can simply tie your rope onto the anchor chain. A rolling hitch will do. This is a special uh, chain hook. I've got uh, one of these on board. My rope's um, attached to the eyelet there. And this actually clips over the chain. And this is probably how not to do it. Uh, if you look at the size of the uh, snubber there, it's not going to do anything at all. That's very, very short. It's going to make no difference at all. Whereas this is really how it should look. Clearly, this image here is showing you that the strain is actually on the rope and that the chain is nice and slack. My favorite subject. I can see some of my colleagues rolling their eyes as they usually do. Should we hoist an anchor ball? And from my point of view, yes, we should. Uh, probably because I'm a sailing instructor and people know who I am down here. And if I don't put an anchor ball up, they will chastise me. But remember, it is the law. Uh, all commercial vessels will have an anchor ball up, even the biggest of the big ships out there. It might not be obvious. If you look carefully, there will be an anchor ball, anchor ball up there. So it is, require, it is a, re a legal requirement. Lots of yachts, very few put anchor balls up. But uh, I think we should. I think it's a part of seamanship. I like to do it. Uh, and that's why it's there. It tells everybody else that we are at uh, anchor and there you go. I've put probably, should you put an anchor ball up? Probably you should. Perhaps more importantly, should we show an anchor light? Well, we may think that we're anchored up for the night. We might think, well, nobody's going to be coming in at three o'clock in the morning. So why bother? But we should put an anchor light on. We are protecting ourselves. We want to know, but show people that we are there. Um, and certainly on many occasions, I've come across the channel three o'clock in the morning, come into an anchorage. And I'm looking around trying to see who is there, who isn't. So we should put an anchor light up. I do have a bit of a slight issue. Most modern production boats, they combine the anchor lantern with, uh, with a tricolor at the top of the mast. But it's not the best place for it, really. The rules say it should be in the fore triangle of the vessel. And if you think you're coming in Anchorage, you tend to be looking at kind of sea level or boat level and not up in the sky. And so I really think that the anchor light should be lower down. You can see on my little, uh, my boat here, I actually have my anchor light just underneath the anchor ball. Should we show an anchor light? Absolutely, yep. Yeah. Every time we should have that anchor light up. Just let me show you, uh, I'm very proud of this. Uh, anchor lights come in different uh, shapes and sizes. This is one of the old uh, garden lights and I thoroughly recommend it. Go to your local DIY store. These are solar powered. Uh, it charges up during the day. And the beauty of it is you hang it up. So even if you're off the boat, it comes on automatically as it gets dusk. And then early in the morning at five o'clock in the morning, rather than you wasting power on your boat, it switches itself off automatically. Uh, and I think it's just brilliant. I really, I'm sure there's a market for this sort of thing. One little story that goes with this. Uh, many years ago, a small sailing boat came into Falmouth. The ship would just come in from the Atlantic. They'd run out of food. They'd run out of water. Things were not going well for them. They anchored off uh, Falmouth docks, and they were struck at about 2 o'clock in the morning by a fishing boat that was leaving the harbour. And uh, unfortunately, the insurance that was damaged the boat, and the insurance wouldn't pay up, and the insurance wouldn't pay up because they were not showing an anchor light. And I know exactly why they weren't showing anchor light because their batteries had gone flat and I'd taken them home to charge them up. So the poor guy was out there. He was anchored with no light. Um, and yet the insurance couldn't pay for any of the, the damage. So yeah, let's put an anchor light up every single time. Do we need to clean our anchor chain? Well, I, this is a bit of a luxury. Um, a lot of anchorages you go into, uh, I love mud. It's super, super strong to hold the anchor, but you pull up, your uh, chain is covered in mud, the anchor's covered in mud, and you're just bringing it onto your foredeck and then into the locker. Uh, if you have the luxury, and many boats do, they have a, a little hose at the front, and that's great for washing the hose, uh, for washing the chain and the anchor as it comes in. Uh, I have no such luxury on my boat. Uh, I usually end up my hands caked in mud, um, perhaps a, an odd bucket of water, uh, 
might help a little bit, but I have to say at the end of the season, my anchor locker is, is pretty horrid and doesn't need a good clean out. But if you have the luxury, yeah, it's a nice thing to have. I've got a few uh, unusual anchoring techniques here. I just want to run through with you. Anchoring the strong tidal flow. Uh, I've had to do this a few times, not not very often, but sometimes if you're anchoring in rivers with strong tides, the, there's a chance the boat's going to swing into the deep water channel uh, and get in the way of other vessels. And so we can use uh, two anchors, uh, a kedge anchor at the back and a, uh, an our main anchor at the front, and we can hold ourselves. So as the current uh, runs up the river or down the river, the boat is held uh, straight um, so it won't actually turn in the tide. Uh, it's a bit of a pain. You can see how we've dropped the stern anchor, motored forward, dropped the bow anchor, and then settle the boat in between. And sometimes you may have to do this. Anchoring the two anchors. Uh, why would you do this? Well, I guess if you were expecting some strong winds coming in, um, trying to put uh, two anchors out at 45 degrees, it's a bit, it's a bit difficult trying to maneuver your boat with uh, anchor chain down already is, is hard work. And I just say to you, don't worry, don't bother. Just get a bigger anchor. I would never uh, say anchor with two anchors in this way. It's just difficult. And this is another of my little favorite pictures here. And this is anchoring in tandem where we're putting two anchors down. Uh, one is going to hold the chain down uh, to sort of make sure it stays in position. Uh, this looks really complicated with dual two anchors there and a, it's got a, a tripping line at one end. And I'm going to say the same to you. It's a known technique. Don't do it. Just get a bigger anchor. And what about this one? Uh, angels or chums. Uh, the concept here is that once you're anchored, you can lower a big heavy weight down your anchor chain. The idea is to bring the weight down so there's more chain on the seabed uh, again. We've got more bits of string, extra weight, shackles. Uh, try it if you wish, but from my point of view, don't do it. Uh, just get a bigger anchor. And I just thought I'd show you this. This is uh, a technique somebody taught me years ago in the Mediterranean, downwind uh, anchoring. Uh, the concern there was how do you dig your anchor in? Well, you can see the plan here is we sail downwind under the jib. We let the anchor go. And because the forward motion of the boat, it kind of as we swing round into the wind, the anchor is going to dig itself in. Uh, and the, the theory is kind of good, I guess. Um, I did try this once in Falmouth. I think people thought I was a complete idiot, to be honest. Uh, and you have to ask the question, what happens if the anchor doesn't bite? Uh, and second, you are going to be riding over the anchor chain. So you're going to be dragging the anchor chain down the side of your boat. So you're probably going to make some marks and damage on it. So um, it's a known technique, but I wouldn't recommend it. So. Anchoring tips, keep clear of fairways. That poor guy without the anchor light, he got hit. So that should be fairly obvious uh, when you are anchoring. Just keep away from any busy areas. Uh, give other boats space. Uh, this is your classic car park story. I'm sure you all know it. You go into an empty car park, you park your car. The next car comes in, comes and parks right next to you. And we have exactly the same thing with anchoring. You've got a beautiful bay. You come here, you anchor down, it's all tranquil. The next boat comes in, anchors right next to you. Crazy. So give people space, give room. There are, of course, some very busy anchorages around, and sometimes you don't have much choice. But you do just need to think about swinging room and how close you can get to other boats. Perhaps I'm just mentioning here, uh, in certain circumstances where I have been in very tight states, uh, close positions to boats, um, I do as the anchor, uh, sorry, as the uh, as the tide comes in, I can let, let the anchor chain out, and as as the uh, the tide goes out, so I'm drifting further back. I actually pull some anchor chain in just to try and restrict my swinging area. But you have to be in attendance on the boat all the time to do that. Just this specific: uh, if you are having to anchor, you know there's strength, strong winds are being forecast, uh, and I'm very aware of this up in Scotland. Try and find yourself somewhere that's got a tree, a small woodland area. These will break up the strong winds. So if, you're, if you've got a choice of either open mountainside or a trees and bushes, anchor somewhere there are trees because they break up those winds. And conversely, steep mountains are bad news there. And I've done this before. Uh, anchored at the base of a mountain and the, the wind comes screaming over the top 
down the mountain and you get really nasty squalls. So just something to consider in strong wind conditions. Uh, be prepared. So coming into an anchorage, first thing, get your anchor ready. I've seen boats come in at the last minute and that they decided to stop the boat and anchor. And then there's five minutes as they're getting the anchor out and getting the chain out. Have it prepared. This is a rather unusual looking anchor, I have to say. But you can see the point is they've got it over the roller just above the water so that when the command is given to let the anchor go, it's ready to drop. Uh, flaking. Um, I was always taught to flake the anchor. I think the correct word is faking the anchor. I could be corrected on that. Uh, this was how I was taught when I was a lad. Uh, where we get the anchor chain out and we flake it along the deck, the required amount we want. Um, and the idea of this is that when we actually drop the anchor, we know it's not going to get jammed up. It's going to run freely. And it's great. The theory is good. Uh, but I have to say for you guys who perhaps have got teak decks, putting a rusty, uh, dirty chain on them is not going to be a good idea. And so even for me, I have to say I don't flake my chain anymore. Um, and yes, sometimes it does get jammed up, but I can clear it pretty quickly. Use gravity to lower the anchor. When you actually stop the boat, you need it to drop down pretty quickly. Um, and again, if you're using an electric windlass, you press the button, it's going dugga, 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 dugga. And by the time the anchor gets down to the seabed, you've drifted back 10 meters. So a lot of windlasses have a clutch system like this. And once you've got the command to drop the anchor, you release this clutch and you want to get that anchor down pretty quickly. So if you're anchoring at five meters, get those first five meters down quickly and you'll know it's got there. It, the, the chain will go out quite rapidly. And as the anchor hits the seabed, it'll slow down. And then you just control the anchor chain and let the boat drift backwards. Should you use a tripping line? Well, this is a very personal thing. And I have to say for me, uh, I hate tripping lines. They are just a painful bit of rope that gets in the way. They get caught around your propeller. They get caught around other people's propellers. I've even seen another boat trying to pick up the uh, tripping line, thinking it was a mooring buoy. The idea of a tripping line is that it is there so you can recover the anchor in case it's get jammed. Uh, and my technique for that is something like this. I carry a short piece of chain on board and if the anchor does get caught i can shackle that chain around my main chain attach a rope to it and i can lower it down the chain down the stock of the uh, anchor and i can pull the anchor out uh, backwards if required and i have to say in all the years i've sailed i have never had to do this but i'd rather do this than have a tripping line that's just going to get in the way. And with regard to dropping that chain, this is also what we don't want to happen. So when we let that chain out, don't drop all the chain immediately. As I said, if we're dropping in five meters, we drop five meters and then let the boat drift back slowly. So we lay the chain out on the seabed. If you let it all out, you've got all the chain sitting on the anchor, all gets tangled up. That is not going to do anything good at all. Gently does it. So we're going to dig the anchor in. I've seen plenty of people. They ram their uh, engine into a stern and go back and they're surprised when the anchor pulls out. And I like to do this nice and steadily and slowly. Once the anchor's down, the boat's settled in. I just put the boat into ticking over reverse, just gently. The boat comes back and I observe the anchor chain stretching out. And I put my foot or my hand on it just to sort of feel. And you can feel if the anchor is actually holding or whether it's bouncing on the bottom. And if it seems to be holding, I stop the engine, I drift forward a bit, and I give it another slightly more positive pull. And usually I do it a third time. Just gently bring it in till I know it's in. And if I'm expecting some bad conditions, then I will uh, put a bit more welly onto the engine just to make sure that it's uh, in tight. Okay, so we're getting to the end now. Are we moving once we're anchored? We want to make sure that the boat is not anchoring. How do we do that? Well, the traditional method is using transit. So having anchored, we line up two objects. Uh, here I've got a, a rock and a tree. And I just observe them. Um, and while the tree and the uh, rock are lined up, that's great. But if I notice the tree and the rock have moved apart, I can see that my anchor must be moving. 
And so normally once I'm anchored up the first hour, while I'm tidying up, having a cup of tea, I just keep observing the transit to make sure everything's good. Anchor alarms. Uh, there are apps um, and there are facilities on your chart plotters that allow you to put, uh, for example, a range in. Once the anchor's down, you give it the range. And then if the vessel drifts out beyond that range, 100 feet, whatever, the anchor alarm will, will sound. Uh, I'm not a great fan of these. The alarm seems to always be going off at 2 o'clock in the uh, morning for no reason whatsoever. Um, one of the important things, if you are going to use this sort of system, you must set the alarm as the anchor goes down and not wait until actually you've got all the chain out because then your your swinging circle will be different from the actual pivot point of the anchor. So it's just something to consider. As I said, I don't tend to worry about this. Once I'm anchored, if I'm if I, once I've the anchor's dug in firmly, I'm pretty confident I'm not going to go anywhere. If I am doubtful and uh, if I'm expecting some strong winds, I might use my uh, GNSS. Um, I uh, many of you will have something like uh, Navionics on your tablet or your phone, and this is an example here. And this is typically a track uh, on my uh, my Navionics uh, on my phone. And what I do is, if I am concerned, I actually take my phone to bed with me. We all do anyway, I'm sure. And um, I have it so it's recording the vessel's track. And you can see that we get this little curved shape when the boat is swinging backwards and forwards. I've just added this in here. You can see the anchor and the sort of the anchoring circle. And while we've kind of got this nice little curvature there, and the wind is swinging sort of from the west to the northwest, then I can sleep peacefully. But if I sort of glance at my phone at three o'clock in the morning and I see this little wiggly line appear, then I know I'm on the move uh, and it's time to get up and start the engine. And finally, worth just mentioning, uh, the anchor chain, we talked about snubbers. Very often, if I'm expecting bad, expecting bad conditions, I would actually choose not to put my snubber on because I will hear the chain. And if it starts to drag, I can clearly hear the chain and the anchor grumbling on the seabed. And I actually use that as an indicator for, uh, to actually take some action. Recovery, just a little thing here to use the uh, windlass. Uh, the windlass is designed for pulling the anchor up and down. It's designed for the weight of the chain and the anchor. It's not designed for pulling 50 tons of boat up to it in a force eight. So just remember that if you are recovering your anchor in windy conditions, you are going to be using your engine to drive that boat forward just so the chain is always up and down and the anchor winds is just pulling up on the chain and the weight of the chain of the anchor. And you'll use hand signals, agree some hand signals with the person who's steering the boat at the back and the person at the anchor. And finally, sometimes when you are reco re recovering your anchor, um, especially boats with bow sprits that have got some chain bob stays underneath them. We have a problem that when the anchor comes up, it's facing the wrong way uh, and it's not going to come over the roller evenly. Um, and so you end up with sort of boat hooks and feet trying to push and rotate this anchor around uh, so it's facing the right way so we can get it back over the roller. And just last year, uh, I was having uh, exactly this problem and the mates turned around to me and said, just go by stern, just go backwards. And by going backwards, nice and slowly, the anchor rotates and rotates itself into the correct position. And then you can pull it neatly over the roller, which just show, goes to show you can teach an old dog new tricks. Okay, that's my little bit. I think I've been talking for about probably too long, 50 minutes. So um, I'll pass back, back to Lauren. Uh, any questions? So... Um, our first one was from Christopher Merriman, who said, are all nations happy for yachts to overnight anchor in locations not marked on the charts, uh, notwithstanding obvious environmental, historical and national security reasons that you've mentioned? As far as I, as far as I'm aware, the answer is yes. Or as far as I'm aware of all the places I've ever been, um, but I suspect there will be politically, there will be very politically sensitive countries that may uh, consider that's not uh, passe. Um, I would, you would always need to check carefully, but pretty much when it comes to the sea and the seabed, it is, it is a free for, for all of us to actually utilize. But I guess in some of, sadly, in some of these 
war-torn countries, I think maybe anchoring off a beach somewhere might not be classed as a good idea. But pretty much, I'd say, yeah, you can anchor pretty many places. That's, um, I did put that to Ed as well, um, Ed, Hugh Ed. Um, and he said the same. He said, generally, yes. He says there could be some country somewhere that isn't, but he hasn't been there. And he said, some South Pacific islands are very strict about where you can and cannot anchor and say you must anchor in designated anchorages. But they are usually small countries, and he would think that it's probably uh, environmental issues. Yeah, so, I same. That, yeah. <laughs> um, so Vitaly asks, um, it is not about anchors, but which is a better place to sleep, the bow or the stern? Um, uh, probably the stern. I, I, it depends on conditions. Certainly, if it's flat calm, it really doesn't make any difference at all. But if there's any sort of motion, any swell, or bobbing, you are going to really feel it at the front of your boat. Um, I don't have anywhere to sleep at the back of my boat, but on certain conditions, I have slept in the saloon, which is more comfortable. Uh, so yes, certainly the the front of the boat is not good. And on passage, we never use the fore peak. That becomes a sort of storage area because it's where the worst motion is. So definitely, uh, yeah, only sleep in the front if it's uh, if it's calm conditions. Super. Uh, we also had Ka Gavin Davis asked, doesn't the anchor light have to be at the masthead? Absolutely not. No, the rules say it should be in the four triangle, which really does mean somewhere between the top of the mast, the bow and the base of the mast. Um, and it should be traditionally in that sort of area where I showed you on my boat. Uh, it, people put them at the top of the mast for convenience, just so you can have it wired up to switch and it's a handy place to have it. And you don't have to sort of get it out and put it away. But it is not the best place. Uh, it is high up and people are not tending to look high up in the sky when they're coming into a dark anchorage. So, though I would say probably 95% of boats, that's where the anchor light is, uh, the all-round white light. But I'd say it's far better to have it lower. Visley has asked another question. Um, it, it says, can't we fix the rudder on some angle? to current to stay away this is about the two anchors at the bow of the stern uh, not you can use your rudder to some extent but if you imagine a lot of the rivers and i'm thinking about north Brittany, they're quite narrow and the tidal stream runs at three or four knots in one direction and turns to 108 degrees in the other direction your boat regardless of how you set your rudder the boat is going to swing uh, even in just probably two knots of uh, two knots of tide, it's enough that it's going to hold your boat. So even though the rudder will allow you to do a little subtle change of direction, it's not going to hold it. And so when you stop these two or three knots, the only way to stop your boat swinging right out into the, the deeper channel and perhaps getting in the way of ships is by putting two anchors out. And Marie has a question out of the mousing points. Uh, we have a swivel, stainless steel, which cannot be moused. Has always seemed a bit odd to us. Any thoughts on this? Depends on the swivel, I guess. I, some swivels seem to have like captivated bolts or alum bolts that go in, which you do up tightly. Uh, I suppose there's nothing to stop it coming undone. I You could use some like super glue or Loctite to seal it. Um, my swivel, I think, has got eyes in it. So you've got, you, I have got a shackle at each end, which I can mouse. But it is, uh, it is a problem. And and I have read a number of articles that actually don't recommend swivels. They they always say they are the weak point of the system, um, and it is far better not to have a swivel at all uh, and just a chain. But obviously, you do have the problem as we discussed that sometimes. The anchor uh, won't align itself up when you bring it back in. So that's, of course, why people fit, uh, uh, fit a, a swivel. And I just say, all I can do is just be very careful, just monitor it very closely because there is a risk that it will fail, that something could get undone. So I guess, you know, every every time you, or maybe once a week, you should just have a close look at that swivel and make sure it seems all tight. Uh, and it's not going to undo itself. Super. And Stuart, one of our um, instructors and course content creators. So Stu said, um, an angel is useful as two anchors in series when you don't have a windless, windless, so you don't always have to pull up the full weight of a larger anchor in light conditions or over a short lunchtime anchor. But I'm with Alan, just use a better, bigger anchor. 
Uh, and he also said, um, as for anchoring anywhere, another example was we had to request permission whilst in Cuba and were only allowed a handful of prearranged places. Right. Yeah. And Marie's asked, do you like to reset your rockner if a big wind change is due? Um, it's a good question. And the answer is no, my... My experience of the Rockner is it really is an excellent anchor and it, it does set itself quite nicely even with a wind change. And so I wouldn't I wouldn't reset the anchor unless I knew it was uh, causing troubles, it was starting to drag. But no, I'm fairly confident that even with a big wind change, the Rockner is going to reset itself without any uh, any help from me. So I'm, I'm happy with it. Fantastic. I, I don't think we've got any more. Oh, Charlie feels the same way about her Rockner. Yeah, we love our Rockner. <laughs> We haven't got any more questions coming in at the moment. So uh, maybe I will take this opportunity to say thank you so much, Alan. That was fantastic. I do love listening to you. So that was uh, that was great. <laughs> and uh, thank you, everyone, for coming as well. Brilliant. Yeah, thank you all very much. It's nice to talk to you all. Okay, Charlie, when the house bears about 270 degrees information to work out our distance from the lighthouse and use that. We might be perfectly on track, but if we're not on time... Let's have a look. I've got my phone here at the effect it has on our steering compass. So our echo sound is working. We can find a contour and follow it nicely into port. Our left hand is pointing towards the centre of the low. 